Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Vila Magnus, and I am the Director of Communications at the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning, IYAFP. On behalf of the YIELD and IVP Networks team, I would like to welcome and thank you all for joining us today on our webinar, The Gendered Experience of Youth Leadership in Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, Bridging the Chasm. Based on the registration list, I understand we're joined today by people from over 60 different countries. Welcome, everyone. We are honored to have so many of you from across the world with us today to participate in this conversation, share your ideas, and we look forward to receiving your questions all throughout the presentation. The fact that so many of us have joined for today's discussion, despite how busy we are, serves as a reminder of how critical this matter is, especially in light of the pandemic and our efforts to curtail long-term impacts on young people, especially young women and girls, this health freedoms, and quality of life. I want to kick us off by sharing a little personal story. I come from a society that champions women to a certain extent until patriarchal values come in. For so many years, I have been policed about the things I say and the clothes I wear, where I can or can't go, what I can or cannot do. And I have been told that when championing for my rights or the rights of others, I am too much, too loud. And that undoubtedly has shaped a person, the person who I have become today. It had been with great hopes and anticipation that I would find a community where I and other young women like myself would feel safe and are able to reach the dreams and goals that we have set, only to be told or shown time and again that there is a glass ceiling we continue to struggle to break. Young women like myself and my peers have continued to struggle through a range of gender-specific challenges that compromise our SRHR leadership trajectories, leaving us disadvantaged and at times at risk. Based on my story and the many others captured in the YIELD project research on gender, the time is now to address the gender inequality that is hindering the critical contributions of young advocates and leaders working to improve SRHR. On our agenda for today, we'll be kicking it off with an introduction of our speakers before moving on to a presentation on the findings and recommendations from the YIELD gender paper. Afterwards, we will be jumping into a session with a brilliant pair of young female leaders where they will be sharing their perspectives. Next, we will then respond to some of your questions and close with some concrete suggestions for how you can take immediate action in your work. Next slide, please. We are joined here today by Gen Jennifer Catino, the coordinator for the YIELD project, who is currently based in Barcelona, Spain. Emily Battistini, the YIELD project research lead, who is based in New York City. Anna Aguilera, the deputy director for adolescent and youth sexual and reproductive health at Engender Health, who's currently based in Washington, DC. And last, but most certainly not least, we are joined by Judy Amina, the Youth Country Coordinator Kenya, for Kenya Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance, who's based in Nairobi, Kenya. A huge welcome to you all. Before we begin, I would like to quickly review key logistics for today's webinar. The webinar will be recorded and you're free to submit any questions you may have for the panelists at any point. The Q&A box will be kept open as we go along. And if you have yet to read the full report, you can do so by downloading it through the handout section on the GoTo platform or visit yieldproject.org. And so now, before we move on to an overview of the Yield Project and the gender research findings and recommendations, we'd like for you, our audience, to respond to a quick poll question. This will give us all a better sense of who is joining today, and it's right here on our screen right now. So, Please let us know, do you identify as a young person slash youth leader, a practitioner, a researcher, or a funder? Please select all that may apply for you. Keep your answers coming. I see them. Probably got about 40, 45 seconds left here. All right, 75% of you have voted. Keep it coming. I'd like to see it close to 100. 
All right. I think we're in the last five seconds. A little bit longer. And I think we're good. Thank you guys so much for joining the poll. Um, it looks like we have over 50%, 57% of you who are practitioners joining us today, with the next majority being a uh, young leader. It is so great to have each and every one of you joining us today. Uh, shout out to the researchers and the funders um, that we have on this webinar as well, of course. All right, without further ado, over to Jennifer to provide some background and context about the YIELD project and the gender research. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Fila, for sharing some of your story and your wonderful kickoff. Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. To set the stage for sharing our findings, I'll provide some context and background about the YIELD project and the gender research. Next slide, please. The YIELD project began in 2017, motivated by an awareness of growing momentum around youth participation in sexual and reproductive health and rights activities around the world. Yet despite long-term widespread and increasing efforts, there appeared to be relatively little documentation of how this work is being done and evaluation of what kinds of results it's achieving. So with support and guidance from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the Summit Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the YIELD project was initiated to capture a snapshot of the state of the field. The project began with a study engaging over 150 current and former youth leaders, as well as representatives from youth serving organizations, academia, and philanthropy from more than 20 countries. Cross stakeholder experiences, insights, and recommendations are synthesized in a report called Young People Advancing Sexual and Reproductive Health Toward a New Normal which offers findings on how to foster authentic youth engagement in SRHR, the impacts that result, and recommendations to strengthen and grow the stream of activity and investment. Since conducting the original research, the YIELD project has continued to share the learning, encourage uptake of the recommendations, and learn more about key issues that emerged. Next slide, please. When we analyzed our initial data, stark differences in the motivations, experiences, and career trajectories of young females compared to young males emerged, which encouraged us to explore the issue more deeply. To do this, we conducted two rounds of additional data collection, including nearly 20 key informant interviews, mainly with young female leaders from Africa, the Americas and the Caribbean, and South Asia. To balance and contextualize the qualitative data, we also conducted a global mixed methods survey that received close to 150 responses from a diverse range of global stakeholders. And we'll share more about the methodology in a moment. This piece of research focused on young female leaders in an attempt to highlight their experiences, insights, and perspectives. It did not capture dimensions related to sexuality, other gender identities, or race. These are some of several important limitations more fully described in the paper. What the research does offer is a glimpse of the gender dynamics currently operating in the field. And this window into the experiences and perspectives of young women in SRHR leadership roles provides critical and compelling arguments for urgent and intentional action to address pervasive inequality. We've compiled these findings in an issue paper titled When the Gap is a Chasm, the Gendered Experience of Youth Participation in Leadership and Sexual and Reproductive Health which can be downloaded along with other resources at yieldproject.org and is, is available, as Fila mentioned, through the handouts. So with that background, I'll turn it over to Emily, the YIELD Project Research Lead, to share an overview of the gender findings and recommendations. Over to you, Emily. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I'm Emily, and uh, next slide, please. And I'm gonna give you a little more detail on our methodology before moving on to discuss the findings and recommendations that emerged from our research. As Jen has already noted, this phase of our research involved two additional rounds of data collection, including nearly 20 key informant interviews and a global mixed methods survey that received close to 150 responses. You can see the types of roles that our survey respondents occupied here. 
Next slide, please. And a breakdown by gender identities here. Next slide, please. I'm now gonna give a brief overview of our findings. I'll touch first on the inequitable norms and unequal demands that construct the double burden of being young and female, then describe how these social and structural experiences translate into specific obstacles to the advancement of young women in SRHR. Finally, we'll talk about the coercion and violence that current youth, female youth leaders often face. Next slide, please. So first, unequal, the double burden of being young and female. Every young female leader we spoke with cited larger social and structural constraints, including inequitable gender norms, as major barriers to her participation in leadership in SRHR. Next slide, please. Inequitable gender norms hold young women back in multiple intersecting ways. This might mean enforced limits on time, mobility, and autonomy, unequal housework and care work responsibilities, lack of support for female education and professional development, and all too often vulnerability to multiple forms of gender-based violence. As girls age and mature, these gendered burdens and expectations often become more restricting, especially for young women of low socioeconomic status who shoulder substantial care work and even wage work responsibilities on behalf of their families. There is also a particular stigma associated with matters related to sexual and reproductive health. Young women receive less family support for their SRHR roles. They also experience more community level backlash for their involvement with SRHR issues as sex and sexuality are more taboo when addressed by female advocates. In the words of one female youth leader, my experience has been that I've gone into spaces where certain things can be said by my male counterparts and won't be frowned upon. But if I say it as a young woman talking about sex in such spaces, I'm usually scorned or stigmatized or discriminated against. Next slide, please. Yield survey data suggests that all of this takes its toll. Over 70% of our respondents cited both inequitable gender norms and the stigma associated with speaking openly about SRHR as among the most significant barriers to female participation and leadership in the field. Close to 50% of respondents reported observing or encountering these barriers in their own work. And this wasn't all. Other associated barriers, like backlash from families and communities, unequal housework and care work responsibilities, and limits on time and mobility were also considered significant constraints on young female leaders. Next slide, please. So moving on now to unfair or the specific obstacles that female youth leaders face. Basically, inequitable norms and unequal demands deny young women opportunities, and this contributes to young female advocates being less confident, qualified, and professionally successful than their male peers. Next slide, please. Patriarchal environments make girls and young women feel inadequate and insecure. They also limit the opportunities open to young female leaders who have more difficulty accessing trainings, securing renewed positions, and achieving ongoing recognition and promotion in SRHR. This in turn creates a vicious cycle by making educational opportunities harder and professional opportunities harder to access, either through outright exclusion or lack of support for the kind of work-life conflicts that plague women in their reproductive years. Inequitable environments rob young women of the capacity to surmount their competence issues by deliberately building their own qualifications. The result is young female leaders who are not only objectively less qualified than their male counterparts, but who also lack the ability to convey their value to potential employers and funders. Our informants were unanimous in their belief that differences in competence, qualifications, work patterns, and self-promotion are creating severe gender imbalances both in current compensation and access to future opportunities. The cycle is, again, self-fulfilling. As male youth leaders advance and female youth leaders lag behind, these gaps in resume and accomplishment compound each other, radically limiting the ability of young women to succeed or support themselves with their SRHR work. Unfortunately, the fact that young women are often the backbone of youth-led and youth-serving organizations, in part because of their reluctance to take time off to pursue professional development opportunities for fear of either harming the institution or shifting the burden of their work onto colleagues, rarely seems to matter. In the words of one female youth leader, young women don't get the opportunities that young men get. Even as advocates or in any position, they tend to raise men higher than women. Women are more passionate, but men become the face of the cause. Next slide, please. We could see this even in the larger qualitative data set from the first phase of yield research. 
as we analyzed the data set, it became clear that some of the codes we created or the lenses we used to interpret the data applied much more frequently to the responses of female informants. This was true for codes like motivation to engage personal experience, suggesting that young women were more likely to engage with SRHR efforts as a result of personal and often negative life experiences, backlash forms of discrimination, suggesting that young women were more likely to experience backlash and discrimination as a result of this engagement, and safety and self-care, suggesting that young women perceive themselves to be more vulnerable as a result of their SRHR work than young men do. The only code that applied more frequently to the responses of male informants was professional growth. Taken together, this suggests that young men experience greater professional rewards for engaging in SRHR efforts and that young women run higher risks as a result of their engagement. This is a reflection of the larger gender imbalances we describe in our report. Next slide, please. So moving on now to the last of our three findings, unsafe, or the coercion and violence that female youth leaders experience. We found that girls and young women experience higher rates of violence and coercion in their professional lives and are often ill-equipped to manage incidents when they arise. These threats harm and derail young female leaders while further limiting their impact as advocates and champions. Next slide, please. As you can see, yield survey data suggests that girls and young women are exposed to a wide range of threats as a result of their SRHR work. Equally troubling, only 37% of our survey respondents had no firsthand knowledge of any form of threat or coercion, suggesting that incidence rates are likely high across the field. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the qualitative data we gathered over the course of the project reinforces this claim. The young female leaders we spoke with described specific incidents of violence and coercion, ranging from workplace and cyberbullying to sexual harassment and international conferences. Several of these young women expressed disappointment at the lack of support they received from supervisors and supervisory organizations. An independent review of organizational safeguarding policies was beyond the scope of this project, but the perception of young female advocates is that many smaller organizations do not have clear safeguarding policies and that many large organizations require young women to cut through so much red tape that the process can become re-victimizing. This too aligns with yield survey data. While roughly 65% of respondents reported that their organizations have gender safeguarding policies in place, only 43% felt that the policies are effective. In the words of one young woman, I literally received death threats working in a community on SRHR issues. We were doing a training with girls and the elders considered that we were encouraging the girls to be promiscuous. There was no safeguarding policy or protocol in place. Next slide, please. So far, we've described the problem, but now we'd like to spotlight solutions. We're gonna do this briefly so as not to run over time, but please note that a richer, more detailed version of these recommendations can be found in the report. And note also that we're going to proceed according to the yield process map, which highlights strategies to find, equip, enable, connect, and track. Next slide, please. First, we'll discuss how to find and equip young female leaders. A critical way to identify and engage girls and young women and build their knowledge, skills, and capabilities so that they become leaders in the field is to involve them in the full program life cycle. By reaching out to existing groups of young women and leveraging their knowledge of local needs to identify underserved populations and shape flexible responsive programming, we can create participation and leadership opportunities for more diverse cross-sections of the population. We can also cultivate deeper, broader, and more sustainable pipelines of young female leaders while adapting our training programs to better respond to the specific barriers that these leaders face. Our research suggests that effectively capacitating young women is an iterative process. An essential part of this process is providing successive opportunities for development and advancement, including capacity building that spans multiple organizational domains. Next slide. Of course, in order to enable young women to act as contributors and leaders in SRHR, we must do more than capacitate them. We must also tackle four interrelated tasks, the cultivation of gender equitable organizations and organizational cultures, the establishment and implementation of responsive safeguarding policies, the mainstreaming of female leadership, and the fair compensation and resourcing of young women in their organizations. Young women will never reach their true potential as advocates of champions if we do not do more to cultivate gender equitable organizations and organizational cultures. This means establishing and implementing institutional policies and practices that directly address gender inequality and how it plays out in organizations, 
and that help young women manage life transitions, balance care work responsibilities, and achieve ongoing professional development. Possible strategies include, and I'm gonna take us over to the next slide here so you can see the responses from our survey. Instituting formal mentoring arrangements, providing professional development opportunities specifically geared towards young women, allowing flexible work hours or time-sharing arrangements, managing burnout, and providing paid parental leave, maternity benefits, or subsidized childcare. These are, in a sense, the minimum supports necessary to promote inclusivity. But the larger goal should be to transform organizational cultures and commit to supporting young women as they manage the gender demands of their professional and personal lives. Obviously, another crucial part of enabling young women is keeping them safe. Our young female respondents spoke repeatedly of the need to institute more explicit, effective, and responsive safeguarding policies. Organizations will need support in doing this, and young women themselves should be involved here as the only way to bridge the gap between inadequate policies and unnecessarily rigid ones may be to co-design them with the populations they are intended to serve. This is also an area where funders can play a significant role in nudging organizations in the right direction. We also need to mainstream female leadership, fairly compensate young women for their work, and shift the funding paradigm to get more money into the hands of young women's organizations. Compensation is particularly important here. Providing fair compensation across SRHR initiatives would take seriously the field's commitment to empowering young women and nurturing their leadership. And the converse is also true. Not providing equitable compensation is a de facto decision to exclude promising young women from the field. Next slide, please. On now to connect. In order to create pipelines and pathways for young women who want to grow as advocates and leaders and age up rather than out of SRHR work, we need to establish formal female support networks that connect young women to each other, as well as to ongoing professional opportunities. Our respondents emphasize the value of formal female support networks as a means of instilling confidence, shoring up support, and sharing learning. Next slide, please. Our last recommendation has to do with tracking the gendered experiences, perceptions, and impacts of young women working in SRHR. One of the major takeaways from yield data in this area is the need to conduct more and better research around gender inequality in the world of SRHR work so that we can better understand the ways that gender dynamics affect local contexts and underserved populations. Only then can we implement solutions and monitor progress. And with that, I'll hand things back to Fila. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, before we move on, just re a reminder to the members of the audience, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please feel free to send them into the questions box. We'll be reviewing them as we go along. Once again, thank you so much, Emily and Jennifer, for sharing with us the important findings and useful recommendations from the gender research. We've now seen the obstacles and challenges young women face as leaders in the SRHR field, as well as the recommendations that they themselves have shared on how to overcome them. Now, we have the great privilege of hearing directly from two young women currently leading SRHR efforts in their work. They will be reflecting on the research from their own perspectives and offer examples of what they see working to address gender inequality among youth leaders in SRHR. With us today, we have Anna Aguilera and Judy Amina. Welcome, ladies. Judy and Anna, we've just heard from Emily about the key findings and recommendations from the report on how best to empower and support young women and level the playing field for female participants and leaders in SRHR efforts. Being remarkable young women yourselves with an extensive amount of experience in the field, could you please provide a brief introduction of how the participation and leadership of young women features in your current work? Judy? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. As introduced, my name is Judy Amina. I work for as the Youth Country Coordinator for the Kenya Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Alliance. And currently, we're implementing a program called Get Up Speak Out, which is popularly known as the GUSO program. This program primarily focuses on uh, meaningful participation for young people ensuring that young people are meaningfully engaged and involved at all levels of programming and that they are able to achieve a supportive environment in accessing reproductive health services, education, and the legal space. While working with the GUSO program, I work with a range of young people in leadership roles. And currently in Kenya, there are more young women who are in these leadership spaces uh, compared to their male counterparts. And this is not by accident, 
Uh, it's because the GUSO program is intentional about ensuring equitable program participation through one of our guiding principles, which is the gender transformative approach. In our context, uh, young women also face gender specific challenges. Uh, to give an example, in some of the communities in Kenya where we work, there are issues such as female genital mutilation and contraceptive use. Traditionally, these issues um, are, not, are not usually spoken to by women. And uh, therefore, the young women leaders who go to the community to address these issues are not given the attention or are not given the respect that their male counterparts do. And because of this, it can be very demoralizing. Uh, for example, uh, myself, I've been part of this, uh, of this and uh, we may get very demoralized and I might not be able to speak or express ourselves with confidence as our male counterparts do. However, it can go two ways. It's either the demoralization or being completely assertive to be able to, uh, to be heard more or get the attention from the people in the community. And uh, because of this, the GUSO program through its progression and through its implementation, uh, more sensitizations have been done in the communities. And uh, because of this, more young women, myself included, our capacities have been built and uh, it, has been, it has improved our skills and we've been able to be more aware of our capabilities and community and the community members have also been more aware and used to young women being able to speak openly about reproductive health issues and about issues that uh, they, are, they are traditionally were not be able to be spoken about by women. Yeah, thank you, Phila. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, Honestly, it's absolutely amazing to hear the fact that the GUSO program is not only training and empowering young female leaders, but also managing to sensitize the communities that you work with. Um, it's crucial that we start at the root of it all. And through our work at IYFP, we've clearly seen how much greater of an impact we're able to make when we engage with the gatekeepers from within our respective communities. Once again, thank you. Over to you, Anna. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Ana Aguilera, and really excited to be here today to talk to you about one of my favorite topics. Uh, so I currently serve as the Deputy Director for Adolescent and Youth Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights and Gender Health. And what that means is that I really work across teams, countries, and programs to do two things. The first is to better reach adolescents and youth with SRHR programming that our organization supports and implements, and to, to better work with adolescents and youth across what we do and to amplify and elevate their voices, their participation, and their leadership with a special focus on the participation of girls and young women that we work with. And as a relatively young woman, this work is deeply personal for me, and it's rooted as the yield research suggests in both positive and negative experiences. So as an adolescent myself, when I started this work in this field in youth leadership and participation and SRHR, I was often told time and time again that I had to be extra careful when I was doing certain things and then I couldn't do some things because that was just out of the cultural and gender norms and my box. So as I you know, evolved and I went on and to lead some of the same types of programs as I grew out of my adolescence and into my young adulthood, I sort of grew to accept that girls and young women just have to be more careful at doing things. And over time, I realized how I myself had internalized this inherent belief and stopped questioning why I felt that way and why, what were the root causes of why we think it's okay to tell girls and women that they just have to be extra careful. And I really think it's because we live in this patriarchal society that often blames women and girls for the violence that they experience. And over the, the years, I've been able to, to sort of retrain my brain and my way of thinking to question this and to say that that's not how it has to be. And um, I'm really excited to be here and, and share with you that. And that's sort of my role at Engender Health and what I try to push for. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anna. And I absolutely can't agree more. You know, having spent the nearly the entirety of my life in Malaysia, I have been guilty of having had the same mindset. And it's genuinely taken a great amount of time and exposure to truly replace what has been so deeply ingrained. 
Um, and from the examples of the both of us, uh, it's clear the change will not happen overnight, but it can happen and we most certainly can make it happen. Um, so once again, thank you so much for your response. And now back to you, Judy. Please share with our audience examples of how SRHR efforts you know about reflect the report recommendation. Okay. Uh, so for us to ensure that uh, young female leaders receive the same respect and are, are listened to as their male counterparts in the community and even at organizational levels, uh, the Alliance has uh, built capacities of young women with skills needed in uh, their SRHR work. Uh, that is uh, such a, issues such as budget advocacy in uh, building the in creating value clarifications trainings and workshops on different issues such as in safe abortion in contraceptives use and family planning in sexual diversities and so more and this is mainly because we understand that even as uh, our young women leaders are working in the community they've grown up with the same norms gender norms and uh, stereotypes are uh, instilled within themselves so having these trainings and capacity building spaces and workshops has helped them to also uh, reflect on these gender norms that are unhealthy and um, uh, try to dismantle the to dismantle the beliefs that they might have uh, on their legs about their participation and their leadership. Uh, because of this, uh, we've had uh, more female leaders like myself who are more aware of our rights and can hold our local governments accountable uh, about uh, our safety and about our involvement. Uh, with this also, we are able to negotiate our terms of engagement with our partner organizations, and we also learn alternative ways of engaging with the community and with the stakeholders that we work with. Uh, for example, instead of going to the field to have a sensitization forum, uh, we might instead have a local community radio or a local newspaper uh, have us as, as guests and share with them the issues that we want to speak about. Uh, we also have recently have been able to do a lot of tweet chats and campaigns which have helped to also address some of the advocacy issues that we've gone to and create more awareness on the ground with more young people. So we find alternative ways to be able to do some of these activities. Aside from that, uh, because of these trainings and mentorship that young female leaders have been able to do within our programs, uh, a number of young people have been able to advance their careers and get uh, opportunities within our partner organizations. Uh, for example, we have young uh, women leaders who have gotten opportunities such as program officers, and this is uh, in organizations that are working with us such as CSA, FHUK, and others who have been employed as experts in certain fields such as uh, budget advocacies and are uh, creating memorandums uh, to the county governments. And that is specifically done by Naya Kenya. Uh, we've been able to do more and more research, uh, especially with the GUSO program. And because of the trainings on research, uh, we have more and more young people, young people, especially young women, who are being who are taking part as research research assistants. And uh, with this, we see that more and more young women are actually taking part in the roles in the organizations and the leadership spaces. So all this, uh, we are able to do this because it's intentional. And organization, as much as they call for opportunities for young people, they make sure that they stress and they emphasize on, and encourage young women to apply for these spaces. Aside from that, as I mentioned earlier, there are more young women in leadership roles than men in our 17 civil society organizations that make up the SRHR Alliance. And uh, this is mainly because uh, mostly the young women who get the opportunities, like myself, we are able to mentor other young women and coach the other, other young women and connect them to these opportunities. So there's more role modeling and uh, creating uh, more and more young women who are confident and who are able to take up these spaces. Uh, this kind of uh, peer mentorship also inspires young and enables young women to move into different kinds of leadership roles. And that, that, that's uh, how in Kenya we, we do it. Thank you so much, Judy. I absolutely love that, especially that last bit there when you spoke about female role models and peer mentorship being a reality. Um, I would have to say that on a personal capacity, on a personal note, this is one of the reasons as to why I've loved the time that I have had at the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning, because I've been very fortunate to have remarkable young women who were the founders, um, previous executive members of the organization, who had 
in, who had mentored me in varying capacities, who've championed for me even when I, in certain instances, had failed to believe in myself. Um, truly, without having these women to look to and garner support from, it's very likely that I would not have been able to be here where I am today, you know, moderating this great webinar. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much, Judy. Anna, over to you. Thanks, Vila. So one thing I've learned over my work in this field is regardless of if you're working with a smaller local community-based organization or a large INGO, is that change really has to start from within. And oftentimes, for some reason, we think that working in the SRHR field shields us from a world in which we live in that is patriarchal and often um, exhibits racist practices and beliefs in what we do. And all of that creates additional barriers for young female leaders. So if we really want to cultivate gender equitable organizations and organizational cultures, we have to take the time to dig deep and reflect on how we ourselves are perpetuating harmful gender norms and racist ideas in how we operate and not just in our programming. So in gender health, we're in the midst of this really interesting organizational change process that has been sparked by our most recent strategic plan and our mandate to really walk the walk when it comes to gender equality. And we're looking at how our systems, how our processes, how our structures, how they inhibit equitable gender norms from our HR practices to our safeguarding policies to how we engage and talk to each other. And this process starts with what we call a staff transformation process, where we dig deep through values clarification sessions and dialogues over time to reflect on challenge and change our own biases and our own stereotypes that get in the way of doing the best work that we can. And we do have safeguarding uh, policies and procedures in place, and we have a gender pay gap analysis that's public for everyone to see, and that will help hold ourselves accountable to this work. But this is only one step in the process. And next on our to-do list is to work collaboratively through a youth adult partnership with Choice for Youth and Sexuality, a global youth-led partner, to do two things. And first, we're looking to leverage their expertise in meaningful adolescent and youth participation to adopt a more systematic approach to how we engage in meaningful adolescent and youth participation within our organization. So that means that we'll have to go department by department, policy by policy, and program by program to see how we need to shift our thinking and our way of working. And the second piece, which is equally important, is we want to institute a formal accountability mechanism for engender health to measure and monitor its progress over time to do this work well. And within that process, we're keeping top of mind the intersection between gender, age, and other unique identities of young people that often coalesce and create these additional layers of barriers. So we're thinking you know, with our executive team about the role that young women specifically play on decision-making bodies, on governance bodies, and in senior leadership roles and in gender health. And we recognize that while this is crucial, it will not be enough, right? Young women must be supported and enabled to influence decision-making powers. So it's looking at um, how we view privilege of seniority of age and years of experience within our organization. And this, from this, we'll have to change some of the ways in which we work that have been deeply ingrained into us through, through the years and create more safe and inclusive spaces. Um, but I think to make waves, we need many organizations in this space, not only to come up with policies and procedures, but to actually reflect on challenge and change the way they operate and not just have those policies on shelves. Um, we believe that it starts for us with our partnership with a youth-led organization that will help us recognize, value, and financially compensate youth-led organizations for their expertise while supporting us to be better. And so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. I think it's safe to say that on behalf of youth and youth-led organizations everywhere, we're very excited to be seeing the changes that Engender Health is committed to making. It is most certainly crucial for all organizations out there to be looking to do the same and working together with youth-led organizations who are the true experts of what our needs are. Um, on to the next question that we have. What do you see as the biggest priorities in terms of what needs to happen now to address issues of discrimination 
and violence against young women working in the field of SRHR. Judy? As, as I've earlier mentioned, uh, the SRHR Alliance has uh, made deliberate actions to meaningfully involve young women uh, in, at all the different levels of programming, that is in design, in decision making, in implementation, in research, in advocacy, and many other spaces. Um, however, uh, as many other organizations, uh, we see that there's a lack of uh, policies such as uh, gender safeguarding policies that are officially done in, the, in our organizations. And uh, there's need actually to prioritize the gaps in organizational policies to ensure that there's equitable gender norms in the workplace, including human resource guidelines that will ensure that there's equal pay and equal treatment uh, for young women, especially young women leaders. Yeah, so that's my main priority for this. Thank you, Judy. I'd like to just highlight what you said there. The need to prioritize the gap in organizational policies rings absolutely true. And to just link to one of the interviews that was cited in the report, it will most certainly be beneficial for youth-led organizations that are often under-resourced and underfunded to have access to these policies so that we're better able to adapt and adopt what is working. And hey, everyone benefits. Um, Anna, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Vila. So I see three priorities uh, from my perspective that I think we all need to work on, whether you're a small NGO, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a funder. And the first is we need to individually recognize that we all play a part and we're probably doing things that are either directly or indirectly getting in the way and creating barriers for young women to, for their full participation and leadership. So I would say first start with asking yourself, what am I doing that could be perpetuating harmful gender norms that are preventing young women from advancing in this field? And then ask yourself, how can I change this? Who can I work with? And how can I engage in conversation in my network or in my organization? And a great resource to do these, to start these reflections at least is the Yield Project's discussion guide. And the second priority is I think we really need to approach discrimination and violence from a systems lens. It goes beyond a policy or beyond a procedure and really consider how our ecosystem needs to change, including all of its individuals that feed into it. So it's really easy to fall into the trap of mistaking tokenistic actions for meaningful change. So striving for young women to serve on decision-making bodies and governance boards is absolutely necessary. And we need to keep fighting for that but it won't be enough. And we can't keep equating representation with full participation. And we need to look at discrimination and violence as everyone's problem. And it starts with dismantling the systems and the processes that are complicit with letting it happen or tolerate discrimination and violence. So for us at Engender Health, it starts with dismantling systems and processes within our organization and our networks and making sure that our um, team members and our leadership is held accountable to changing. And so we can't let this report sort of sit on the shelf and view it as a problem that other organizations have or certain individuals have. We all have a part to play. And then the third piece, uh, which really bothers me most days, is we need to stop placing young women in siloed buckets in implementing siloed programs. Taking an intersectional approach to look at discrimination and violence is important. And we need our systems, our policies, and our ways of working to not only recognize that, but address the multiple identities that young women have in this field and the diversity within that. So we can't keep separating you know, our gender-focused work from our AYSRH work, from our work to reach underserved populations. You know, and funders really do have a key role to play. They can shift how funding is structured so that it mandates and supports inclusive gender transformative and youth transformative programming. And we as grantees also need to be brave and push for this, despite knowing that there will always be power dynamics at play, but knowing that you know, we can't keep waiting. So thanks. Thank you, Anna. Honestly, just that last bit right there, taking on an intersectional approach is most definitely the pixie dust in the work that we do. Certainly, we young people do not live single issue lives 
and the programs that work best are ones that are able to address our integrated needs. So thank you so much for highlighting that, Anna. Um, all right, moving on to the next question that we have here. How can you use research such as this to support you in your current work? Judy? Okay, so at the SRHR Alliance, uh, we usually take part more in a national and county level advocacy, mostly on reproductive health. And in these research findings and recommendations provided by YIELD, uh, the gender issue paper, will definitely help to, help to look at advocacy on a gender lens uh, to ensure that the ask that we, asks that we give to policymakers and uh, other stakeholders that are in decision making spaces are more gender transformative and that they are more engaging and they look at the gaps that young, young women leaders face. The Alliance also being a large network of civil society organizations, as I've earlier mentioned, working on SRHR, would actually uh, use these recommendations to shed more light and to guide and to ensure that the programs that they implement and that the work they do in the community in, at county levels and even national and regional levels is more gender transformative and that it's, it ensures equal gender norms and a supportive environment for young female leaders. Additionally, uh, research like this uh, shows that there's need to explore and address gender inequality in our experiences and in our work as young leaders in SRHR. And this actually provides a useful guidance on how to be able to do that. And thank you. Thank you, Judy. Anna. Yeah, I would say, as I mentioned, in gender health is going through a process of reflection and transformation when it comes to working meaningfully and equitably with young people and all their diversity. So the research provided by the YIELD project, and in particular, this gender paper, really shed some light on the urgency and the potential magnitude of this problem. And it really helps us get moving and, and helps us do more advocacy around this topic and light more fire, if you will. Uh, we can't afford you know, to wait for a time where things are less hectic or when we won't have some sort of competing priority. And this research really confirms what many of us have suspected and what our lived experiences have been telling us for a long time, that this is a major problem and that we really need to do something about it. So for us, we're looking at this research in conjunction or collaboration with our meaningful uh, youth adult partnership that we are engaging in and our transformational processes. So we hope that we will be adopting the process for youth participation that's been proposed by the YIELD project, leveraging um, meaningful youth participation experts, global and local youth-led organizations, and delving deeper to really contextualize what and implement those recommendations and what those look like in practice. And so that's, yeah, we have a, our work cut out for us over the next year. Thank you both so much. And I would like to just echo both these ladies here on behalf of IYAFP. I certainly agree that research like this underscores the need to explore and address gender inequality in our experiences and our work as young leaders in SRHR. The guidance provided is most certainly useful as we work every day to address gender inequality. Um, moving on to the next segment of today. Next slide, please. We're going to go into the Q&A session from, based on the questions that we have received from you, the audience today. Um, so just to kick us off, Judy, what are your thoughts about how to engage young male leaders in combating gender inequality? Uh, so my thoughts in uh, engaging young male leaders, uh, usually when you work with young female leaders, there's also young male leaders that are part of this. And I think uh, maybe as Anna had actually mentioned, uh, looking at the systems that actually hold us back, we say that we'll go, when we go to the communities, young female leaders are not able to speak as confidently as young male leaders. Then how about the young male leaders that we work with? Just use the privilege that comes with that to ensure that even the young women leaders that go to the community to have sensitization work to work with them are able to also have the same platform that they do. So for us to, us to be able to have an equal space, we also need the young male leaders that are working with us to 
to ensure that they, that they provide that opportunity and they use their privilege to also support their female counterparts while working in this space. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. I hope everyone was taking notes uh, <laughs> as that uh, was going on. Anna, do you have thoughts or experiences about how the SRHR workplace can be made more supportive to the particular demands that may fall on young females? So for example, domestic workload, child and other care responsibilities, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Sila. So for me, I think there are some things we can standardize across the board. So looking at flexible work policies and you know not being so rigid in our thinking that you have to be working at a particular moment at a particular time. And if you can't, if you don't fit that mold, you know, sorry, but you can't work with us. So I think that there's definitely that. But I guess I would emphasize there are three things that I always think about. Asking, listening, and acting, right? So if we really want to make the workplace more supportive, we need to ask young female leaders and young women in our organizations, ask them what would make it more supportive? What would, what would, how could you feel more supportive? And we can't assume that we know what all young women want or need. And the only way to truly know is to ask. And then when we ask, we need to be open to and ready to listen and actually act on what. So it looks probably very different in, for us at Engender Health. You know, supporting a young female leader in Ethiopia will look very different perhaps than supporting a young female leader in India. And if we don't take the time to ask and really listen, then, you know, we'll, we'll continue to miss key important things that maybe our HR teams or our managers just don't see because they don't experience it on a daily basis. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Emily, over to you. What age range is gender research referring to? And did you find differences by geography and other contextual issues? Um, hi, thanks, Fila. Um, I, I would say that, first of all, the age range was kept um, fairly broad in the gender research. So um, the larger yield research has a fairly wide window that, um, that extends, I think, until, until 34. But um, it is a is a broad window. I think that the emphasis was on sort of later adolescence and youth. But in the survey and in the related um, research, it was kept a, a broad window. And I would say that the differences by geography and other sort of contextual issues, the the um, this was something that we would love to capture in additional research or that should be captured in additional research in this area. And I would say the same thing about differences within that really broad age range, like the needs of younger adolescent girls versus older adolescent girls, older adolescent girls versus um, youth, and similarly differences, urban rural differences, depending on other um, variables here, it would be wonderful to capture more about the experiences of LGBTQA populations, more about the experiences of, um, you know, different racial and ethnic uh, uh, groups, the differences depending on many sort of cleavages that weren't, that weren't in this research, if that makes sense, and that weren't able to be captured within the scope that we had. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you all so much for sending in your questions. We're so sorry for not being able to respond to every single one of them, but on behalf of the team and panelists today, I hope you feel even more motivated to take immediate and intentional action to address gender inequality among young people working to improve SRHR around the world. In that spirit, we have some, some tools to offer. Next slide, please. So what you can do, the YIELD project has developed a number of resources that can help support putting the research recommendations into practice. First, of course, please check out the gender paper if you still haven't done so, and dive a little deeper to learn more from young women about their experiences. There is also a discussion guide available that can help you kickstart conversations at your organization. If you're looking for a more interactive way to foster these discussions, 
and connect with others, check out the storytelling dice game. And last of all, let's not have these conversations end here today or just within our respective organizations. Check out the social media toolkit that has been developed to provoke further online discussions. All of these tools and more are available on yieldproject.org, so be sure to go on and check it out. Um, so having heard everyone speak today, I am heartened by the critical work underway to address gender discrimination and violence in our work as young advocates for SRHR. But the reality here is there is still so much more to do. Each and every one of us here today have the power and the opportunity to change the current reality in our field and enable young women to be the SRH leaders they can and are meant to be. To quote Anna earlier, we need to dismantle the systems that tolerate discrimination and violence and those that are complicit in letting it happen. So ladies and gentlemen, let's make sure we use the research and tools we have heard about today and act on the inspiration provided by our speakers. We need to keep challenging the current realities, challenging the status quo, and make sure we embody the change that we want to see. Before we close, just a couple more things. As was mentioned earlier, um, the recording of the webinar will be available to you shortly. The presentation will also be emailed to all participants. So please be sure to visit the ibpnetwork.org and yieldproject.org for more information. The webinar today has been co-hosted by the Yield Project and the IBP Network. And on behalf of both teams, we'd like to thank you all once again for joining us here today. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.